Guten Morgen. Wie geht es Ihnen? Ich nenne Daniel Gidfix. Er heißt Karan Singh. Wir freuen uns sehr, heute hier zu sein. I don't understand any of this. Okay, we'll go down. Now, in, out of courtesy of those who can't speak German, like ourselves, we will switch to English. Um, my name is Daniel Gilfix, and I'm joined to, today with, by Karan Singh. We're both from Red Hat uh, Storage. Uh, I happen to be working in the business unit focused on storage and hyperconverged infrastructure, and Karan is a solutions architect, uh, part of our solutions engineering team. And we're here to talk to you today about managing data analytics in a hybrid cloud. So here is the agenda that we'd like to propose to you in this short discussion. Um, we would like to review some of the customer challenges that we have seen in the company, working with customers hands-on uh, who are trying to uh, deal with their issues related to data lakes and managing data, and some of the common approaches that these customers have used, perhaps you as well, uh, in dealing with uh, inaccessibility to data in a timely manner. And then to talk about the concept of a shared data lakes approach with a common data set, and, and then more detail on how it works and in what use case, and then perhaps some summary comments on how you might get started. So beginning, uh, our, our, the, the, the challenges can be summed up in the fact that what we've seen is that an increasing number of data analytics teams are needing greater agility to spin up their own clusters with a common private cloud infrastructure without the cost of duplicating data sets in non-shared HDFS silos. Why is this happening? It's because more and more customers have an increased amount of data, uh, big data, whether it's structured or unstructured. And this data is accumulating, as everybody knows. But the challenge is to be able to reap timely insights from this data uh, in their existing data infrastructure. And traditionally, this has been done in monolithic Hadoop clusters. Uh, and many people have been challenged by this effort, given the amount of data and the amount of people who are trying to access this data. And this has led to a, a number of alternative approaches to solving their SLO problems. So in general, there's been three main approaches to dealing with the issue of too much data not, and too many people trying to access this. First, given the fact that Hadoop was built to scale, the, the most intuitive things that customers would do uh, that we've dealt with is to uh, simply increase the size of the cluster. That's option number one, and that, that involves growing the compute and storage in tandem, just making it bigger and bigger. And unfortunately, this has frustrated folks because it's difficult to maintain a single environment, and it, it's difficult to manage conflicting teams who are trying to access this single amount of data. And at the same time, it's hard to, to grow and to scale the compute and storage independently. And realizing these sort of limitations, some of the customers, many, uh, seem to think, well, you know, if we can't grow up, if we can't scale up, let's scale out. And this involves uh, duplicating the data sets. And while this might address some of the isolation challenges that you have by being able to give certain people certain amounts of data and tools, it's also mighty expensive mighty expensive to acquire, mighty expensive to maintain. And plus, within each uh, set of data, you're still growing the storage and the compute 
in tandem. Now, some customers have just decided, all right, you know, this is too cumbersome. I might as well just upload everything to the public cloud where, uh, you know, the storage and analytics can all be managed externally so they can store them in Amazon S3 and provision the access to the tools through EC2. And this happens to be very popular in certain environments where the data originates from the public cloud. And that could be in the government or public sector or healthcare or wherever. But we found that if the data originates on premises, it's much more efficient to be managing the data and the data access on premises. So, you know, that would lead customers to think of a third way, which is here, which is actually making storage a common infrastructure service instead of something that needs to be managed by data platform teams. And it means that teams themselves have the power to spin up the clusters as they need and not have to duplicate the data because they're using a shared common data set underneath. And ultimately the goal in all of this is to make sure that the right people have timely access to the data at the right time and to do so without spending a fortune. So what we're talking about here is disaggregation of storage and compute for analytic workloads. And by having a common data set with a, a common object store that can scale massively, you're not having to purchase and maintain duplicate data sets for every single group. In fact, you could be buying tens of petabytes of data instead of hundreds of petabytes of data. And by giving folks the ability to spin up and spin down the clusters as needed using OpenStack, you can be provisioning and, <clears throat> and increasing a customer's agility to do so. Ultimately, we're maintaining a more common level state of resources where you're not having excess and you're not having too few. You're being able to right size the amount of data and right size the amount of compute. And by empowering the service teams, the service level teams, you are in fact giving access for the right amount of data, the right tools at the right time. So Red Hat has been working with customers for upwards of 18 months, hands on, many who've been challenging this, many who's given us ideas and we've taken these ideas and incorporated fixes into the product which uh, underlies this whole infrastructure solution. We call it the Red Hat Data Analytics Infrastructure Solution. It happens to be a combination of Red Hat Ceph storage, which is the underlying core, um, along with OpenStack, Red Hat OpenStack platform provisioning and uh, Red Hat OpenShift platform for those who are containerizing the data with a collection of services as well. Um, it is uh, offering our customers tremendous amounts of improvements on TCO and analytic performance and um, they're having uh, success and many of these customers have contacted us in an unsolicited, unsolicited way just to say how pleased they are with this type of performance. And some of the benefits that they are realizing by having this type of solution that combines the power of an object store with the power of OpenStack and, and uh, is just reliable performance across the board. Uh, being able to have the right uh, amount of data accessible at the right time for, the, for the, whichever data science just needs to use it. Uh, the open provisioning of compute analytics via OpenStack is, uh, is timely, it's very beneficial to everybody. Moreover, uh, by virtue of our S3 API, 
you can have the same level of experience uh, running in a public and cloud environment, a pu public and a private cloud environment using the S3. So it does make for a hybrid cloud experience using this on premises. And ultimately, you are, and they are seeing re reductions in costs, both from the CAPEX side and the OPEX side, most principally by not having to duplicate data sets, uh, by not having to constantly uh, attach your storage and compute, and being able to flexibly grow and scale out your, your compute and storage as needed. So now I'd like to invite my colleague, Karan, who will go into more detail on how some of this works. All right. So thanks, Daniel, for setting the stage. So if we, if we think about it from the architectural point of view, how does the different generation of data analytics look like? So we categorize it into two different generations. So the generation one includes, comprises of a monolithic Hadoop stack where the analytics vendor, they provide two things. They provide the analytics software itself, and they also provide the single purpose infrastructure for the analytics softwares. And uh, the analytics software itself, it runs on uh, their own, uh, in, uh, their own uh, uh, single purpose inf infrastructure. And one of the problem with the, this kind of approach is that there is uh, no efficient way to, to share the data set across multiple, uh, multiple clusters of, uh, of Hadoop. So, and uh, if you have to do a lot of computing, if you have to do a lot of analytics jobs, then probably you will end up having multiple different uh, silos of uh, data cl clusters, and uh, you need to think about a different and efficient way of uh, not copying the data multiple times across different stacks. Another key point about this, uh, uh, this approach is that if you need to add more storage capacity in your existing uh, uh, cluster, you need to bear the cost of uh, going through and purchasing the compute, which could be lying idle, and you would be simply using the storage part of it. And uh, the other way, other way around to, to is that if you need to add more computing power, you need to purchase storage, which is not being used. So basically, you are simply paying for the resources which uh, are not in use. So this kind of a rigid uh, combination of uh, analytic software with, uh, with the infrastructure, they're tied in a, in, in a very tightly coupled way and uh, we need to find a different, different solution to it. Now, the way we categorize the second generation of uh, this analytics uh, architecture is that we have been, this is an emerging trend right now. So we have been, spoken, uh, we have been talking to 20, 30 odd customers, big companies, and uh, asking about their pain points in the data analytics world. And uh, somewhere around 75, 70, 75% of uh, uh, these companies, they agree that yes, uh, we, are, we are getting locked down because of this monolithic design here, and uh, there has to be an efficient way of doing uh, uh, analytics in, in like uh, uh, now, or maybe five years from now. With the, with the you know, with uh, a lot of new tools, so if you think about this, uh, if you go like back 10 years from now, eight years from now, there were like a handful of tools to do the stuff. So Hadoop, MapReduce, and, and Yarn, and, and Hive, they were the tools. Now, with the explosion of all these data analytics tools like uh, uh, Spark, Presto, Kafka, and uh, lots of other tools which I have not mentioned here, uh, we need to have a different way to uh, design the architecture. So some of these customers which we have been uh, working with, as Daniel mentioned, that uh, we we learn from our customers. They were the early adopters in uh, moving on to this kind of uh, architectural approach. And uh, 
the way they have improved their own large scale data analytics platform and data analytics infrastructure is that they have disaggregated compute with the storage. And uh, now with, uh, with this kind of approach, the analytics, so we are not, I mean, uh, the, the analytics vendor, they will still focus on their own part, which is their analytics software. And uh, what we are proposing is that they could use on-demand provisioning either from OpenStack or maybe in, from Kubernetes or OpenShift in future to, to provision the compute resources for their analytics uh, environment. And all of this happens through uh, a shared object storage underneath, which is based out of Ceph. And uh, that makes you, that gives you the flexibility you need to launch multiple different analytics, analytics clusters without having them share, uh, without having them copy the data set across. All right, so this is how it, it, uh, it looks like. Uh, you will have a, you will have an OpenStack platform which would be powering the compute, a general purpose OpenStack platform powering the compute, and uh, you will then have a shared object storage using, using Ceph, and everybody knows, uh, like, Ceph is, be, is, is pretty popular in, uh, in the OpenStack world since last five years. It's uh, one, of the most used, uh, ob one of the most used storage backend for OpenStack, so uh, Ceph could be reused, or you could grow your Ceph cluster other than providing uh, send the volumes or, or glance images uh, to your OpenStack environment, you could repurpose your cluster, Ceph cluster, and create an object storage pool and uh, use it for big data lake uh, storage. And of course, you get the flexibility to provision multiple analytics clusters, as I mentioned before, and you don't need to uh, waste capacity and, uh, and, and money uh, in just copying the same data set across multiple times. It's so if you think about like, uh, if you have like few terabytes of data or yeah, few terabytes of data, few hundreds of terabytes of data, that should be okay. You can copy 500 terabytes of data across five different, uh, five times more. So it's not very expensive, but if you think about if it's uh, in the order of tens of petabytes, tens of hundreds of petabytes, if you copy the same data set with three different teams or three different clusters uh, within the organization, it's gonna be really expensive. and. Uh, it is expensive not only for, for, the, for the companies, but even for the larger companies who are, you know, uh, they have big budgets, but they are still, still expensive for them. With this, with this architecture, you can get, give agility to your data science team. They are, uh, at a given point, you will have a, a, a data science team. They, are, they need some kind of uh, a compute and, and, and analytics platform by which they can do their, uh, their analytics jobs, other team, so let's suppose the other team wants to run on uh, on the latest and the greatest version of uh, of, uh, of Spark libraries, but they can't do it in in case of a monolithic architecture. They can't do it because it's locked down. You are you have to have used the version that it's built into the monolithic stack. But with this kind of approach, you could on demand launch multiple different clusters of different versions with different tools, all syncing and sharing the data across uh, a single object storage. So as I mentioned, uh, you could use uh, uh, it for, multi it could be a multi-purpose uh, uh, analytics platform. You could use uh, uh, things like Kafka for, for data ingestion in the same cluster backed by OpenStack Compute. And then you could uh, do ETL jobs using uh, uh, Hive on MapReduce or, or Spark on, on C uh, Spark SQL on Spark kind of things. You could have another cluster dedicated for interactive queries for faster query, query responses using Presto and Impala or, or uh, and uh, bad jobs could also be done using uh, MapReduce, either MapReduce, like long-running uh, long reporting jobs, bad jobs could go through uh, uh, MapReduce and Spark. So in a nutshell, you have, uh, you have a common layer providing the compute to different kinds of uh, analytics environment and uh, you are rest assured that you don't, don't need to copy the data set. It's all coming from a single big pool of shared data storage. Another interesting aspect of this kind of design is that uh, uh, you're getting, you, you, you got, you, 
you can consolidate your infrastructure. So if you think about you have a, a, a siloed environment of, of compute and, and storage just for analytics workloads, and then you have your general purpose compute for, for your web application, for your databases, or for other uh, public clouds or private clouds that you have built in-house. You could use, you can combine these two uh, different silos. Uh, you can move in the analytics part into your, your uh, OpenStack-based private cloud in-house. Definitely you could get some uh, advantages based on, on the OPEX. You don't need to have a dedicated person managing your uh, data infrastructure. They could be a part of your OpenStack-based uh, private cloud. So as we've discussed, on the, on the left-hand side of this, uh, you have a monolithic design where you are you're getting, it's inflexible for you to, uh, to scale the cluster and uh, scale the storage. Basically, you, you have to copy the data set. And uh, on the right-hand side, things will look more, more nicer. You have uh, a shared object storage. Compute and storage are decoupled from each other. So you could scale each of these layers at your own pace uh, as, as you need them and solving a lot of problems uh, of multiple data copies. And uh, your data scientists could, could enjoy uh, uh, the shared data experience of uh, the job which is completed on cluster one and the data which is generated by cluster one could be reconsumed by the other cluster instead of you know, copying it across. And thanks to, uh, thanks to AWS S3 and, and Hadoop communities for, for working, working on this part, so uh, S3 is basically, uh, so Amazon is doing this, this architecture in their public clouds. It's been like more than uh, three to five years they have been doing this. And uh, they have, um, so both these communities work together and they have in evolved the version of uh, uh, S3, S3A, which is a file system adapter, which is, the, which is the glue which is making it happen. So this is the third generation of S3A uh, per, uh, adapter. And the first one was, was S3, and the second was, if I remember correctly, it was S3N, was the second, up, second time they tried it. And then they agreed upon the S3A. So S3A is uh, now natively supported by, by the basic, uh, by the standard out-of-the-box uh, Hadoop libraries. And uh, any tool which is being based on, on Hadoop jars, Hadoop libraries, they could simply take care, out of the box, they could talk S3A. So all you need to provide is you need to provide an endpoint, an S3 endpoint. In Amazon's case, it is, it's Amazon S3. In, in a private cloud environment, it would be a Ceph uh, a Redhouse Gateway endpoint. Then you will, uh, you will configure it using uh, the access keys and secret keys in, into, the, into, the, into your Hadoop uh, core site.xml files, things like that. And uh, the tools then, uh, tools like, uh, like Spark and Kafka and, uh, and MapReduce, they could, these guys can simply go and talk to your Ceph cluster like they're doing it in, in, uh, in public clouds. So as I mentioned, as I talked about uh, public cloud offering, so uh, Amazon, and even, even uh, Google Cloud Platform and, and Azure, they're doing this kind of architectural architecture in, uh, in their public clouds. So if you talk about uh, uh, Netflix or, or Airbnb, these guys, they have been using uh, Amazon Cloud for their big data workloads. They are uh, using EC2 provisioning layer for, for the analytics, which is desegregated from storage. And then they are using persistent storage from, from Amazon S3 to uh, do the analytics on a shared, uh, shared data set. So this is, this is a architecture which is, being, which is pretty popular and Amazon EMR is, is doing it. So we want to just move the same uh, experience on premises using OpenStack and Ceph. So OpenStack could be your, uh, your provisioning layer which will give you the compute power needed for these, these clusters. And uh, Ceph will provide a single shared experience for your data. You could also use, I mean, there are multiple ways you could, you could provision cluster. There's no need for me to explain how you can provision clusters in, in, uh, in OpenStack, but uh, Nova APIs are a great example. You could simply uh, use your favorite tools to, to uh, launch a cluster or using Nova APIs or or maybe Sahara OpenStack uh, platform, it could also provision clusters uh, for you, big data clusters. 
So we are extending the same modalities into, into the private cloud from, from public cloud. So we have already covered most of these uh, uh, in this slide. So what you get from this, what are the benefits is you will have multiple analytics clusters, which will enable your multiple teams to, uh, to access the same data set without copying it. You will, uh, you will definitely get low price because you're not copying the data set and uh, faster provisioning of analytics cluster, or I would say on demand provisioning of analytics cluster as you need them. So if you need, you could also uh, uh, make it more flexible, like okay, you could uh, make multiple OpenStack flavors. Okay, this is my flavor for, for high RAM or high memory uh, kind of workloads. So you will spin up that, that particular flavor. And then this is the flavor for production, which will include my, my Spark uh, uh, 2.0 release and, and things like that. So you have the flexibility to, to choose what you need. Now we'll talk a little bit about uh, how does it look like in, in uh, currently how does it look like with, uh, with different kind of data analytics uh, pipeline which is out there. So the modern, so the modern uh, pipeline uh, looks some, like something like this. So you will, have, uh, you will begin with a data generation stage where, you will, where the data is coming in from multiple sources. It could come from, uh, from a stream, um, from a stream of uh, events and then it could, you could also ingest the data in, into a platform using uh, uh, bulk ingestion tools. I'll talk about the tools in the next slide. And uh, data, once the data is pers persisted into the storage layer, you could use uh, tools like uh, uh, ETL and uh, uh, like ETL and MapReduce and Spark to, to do the transformation and joining the multiple data sets together and, and creating a, a data, data repository in your, for your usage. You could also then convert and or transform these data set across different uh, uh, um, versions, probably uh, uh, like different columnar database versions like uh, ORC or Parquet formats. You could convert your deserialized data and use it. You could join the data set, of course. You could uh, do that as well. And uh, for, for querying the data set, you could uh, uh, use uh, tools like uh, Kafka and uh, your clickstream click data set. Wait a minute, yeah, this one. Then once the data is, uh, is uh, transformed, you could uh, uh, you run data analytics queries and jobs for, for business reporting, trying to make sense of uh, what's the latest trend in your, in your company and uh, your product, how it's behaving. And uh, of course you can, your, the same data set and, and the same cleans, cleans data could be used by the data data scientists or data, uh, data engineers to, to do some kind of data exploration work and, uh, and trying to f figure out uh, what's next in your, for the product that they should focus on. And finally, the growing term, the machine learning, you could, uh, once you have uh, your clean data, you could you, you can train the models based on the data that you have and you can do prediction uh, things like uh, uh, TensorFlow and, and the idea is that everything could be done uh, using a shared object storage uh, underneath, and which is what this will enable you in the long run. So mapping some of the tools, some of the different tools for, for this kind of job, so data generation, um, I talked about it, and uh, Kafka could be used for, for, uh, for streaming, even Apache streaming could, use, uh, could be used here, and uh, for ingestion, you could take a look on uh, Apache Nifi and, and Kafka, and uh, the, the long-running ETL jobs could be taken care by MapReduce or even Spark because Spark is in memory processing it. It's pretty faster. And uh, uh, for once you have the data transformed, you could use, uh, uh, again, you could use Spark and, and MapReduce to uh, do the reporting and, and doing the bad jobs. And for interactive query, uh, which is pretty uh, useful for the data science, they need to have responses uh, pretty fast. The, you could use tools like Presto, Impala, and, and uh, Spark SQL to, to achieve that. And TensorFlow for, for machine learning or even other tools which, uh, which I've not written here. So how does it uh, looks like with, with Ceph? How, how many things we have tested with Ceph? So this is, this is a very key slide here. So if not all, we have tried to test a few of them. 
with uh, together with with the partner with our partners and uh, and together with our customers so we have been uh, i'll talk about uh, uh, how we engage with customers in the, in the next slide but uh, yeah we have done a lot of uh, testing in in the last uh, year and a half or two years so for for data generation we we chose a tool uh, we choose a tool uh, chose a tool for, uh, called as tpcds which is a, a industry standard benchmarking tool for for hadoop stacks so most popular uh, uh, data analytics uh, people they they use these kind of tools to to do to generate a data set and uh, there is a possibility to 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 generate data set as you need so we have tested with uh, uh, one terabyte uh, and 10 terabyte and in some cases also with 100 terabytes of data set generation and once we have data set generated in the in the test environment we then do all sorts of work uh, on the data another interesting tool which uh, uh, which one of our partner helped us with is locksynth where we are joining the structured data with with a click stream data and try to uh, uh, have a, 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 a data set which is uh, a combination of structured and non-structured elements. Once it is in, once the data is ingested and transformed, and tools like uh, we have used uh, Spark SQL to uh, to run queries, which are designed, which are defined in TPCDS uh, benchmarking uh, toolkit. So there are uh, somewhere around 100 plus uh, uh, expensive queries with respect to compute and and as well as for data. So we have chosen somewhere around 50 55 queries, which are uh, specifically uh, storage intensive because here we are we are taking uh, we are we don't want to make sure the storage is uh, is doing good so we we chose some 50 plus queries which are io intensive queries and uh, we ran through spark sql uh, and uh, hive on MapReduce. we also ran, uh, ran the same queries in, in presto and impala just to see how does it uh, looks like with multiple different if how does it how does how the performance increases or or even decreases if we change the analytics engine on top of it so uh, so hive and MapReduce and spark sql and spark and then presto and an impala that we have tried with and uh, in the prototyping with for uh, with machine learning we um, it was just a prototype it was not a full-fledged uh, benchmarking test with uh, machine learning but we have tried uh, uh, training a model with the data set in coming from the Ceph object storage. And uh, uh, once the training is completed, the output uh, goes back to Ceph and the model, get, model gets stored. And then you can uh, use Ceph to distribute the model to the, to the application. So that works out of the box. That's, uh, that's, but still need some more, more uh, architectural level benchmarking on, on this kind of machine learning tool other than TensorFlow or, or things. So, one of the offering that uh, uh, we are providing is uh, a close collaboration in the form of POCs and pilots. So, what we do is first, uh, uh, first we uh, qualify, we qualify your uh, your case, and uh, just to before we begin, we try to say, okay, does it make sense for you? Is it uh, uh, should should we go forward with this kind of architectural change, architectural shift in your in your current uh, data data tool? So what we do is we, we sit with your uh, with your business stakeholders, your data data engineers, your infrastructure engineers, um, in a closed room for for uh, two days or one day, whatever, uh, doing some architectural workshop and involving people from Red Hat, uh, people from my team, in fact, and uh, we. Uh, Together with Red Hat Consulting, we sit in a room, we do uh, brainstorming, we try to ask, okay, uh, what are the key questions that you would like uh, to answer with your, uh, with your, to what are the key problems that you're facing currently in your infrastructure with respect to data analytics? So we jot down these kind of questions and uh, try to formulate uh, a test plan, which we then uh, convert all those, those exercises into a, into a work, which something that we could reproduce. Uh, using your data set, or even uh, we could uh, reproduce using TPCDS, which is a, a synthetic uh, data generation tool. And once things are things are in place, we have identified the business case. We try to uh, move on to this new architecture of decoupled computer and storage. And uh, if all goes well, we we compare the the results with uh, your previous testing. If you have done with uh, with your uh, monolithic stacks like Hadoop and uh, HDFS, so. So yeah, once once everything is okay, we uh, we help you with uh, 
phase rollout of this kind of design into your production uh, infrastructure. And uh, yeah, of course, Red Hat Consulting is there for, for all, the chain, all the support that you need. So this kind of an offering that we are providing to our, uh, our customers, like a, pay, uh, like a paid POC and a pilot project. So before going into full-fledged, into this kind of new architecture, you could uh, you know, test it uh, before putting all your stuff in, uh, in this new architecture. All right, so, I'll, so Daniel, could you please uh, give a quick summary? Might be on. Is it on? This is on. No. Take this one. Okay. Okay, so thank you, Karan. Uh, so, quick summary and next steps. Uh, first, I've already told you what I was going to talk to you about, and Karan went into more detail, so let me summarize on what we just told you. That the problems that maybe you, but some of our customers have been facing are summarized here. That they are just missing their, their SLAs. They're not being able to get the data and the value from the data. And this is probably something that's happening to folks in this room. Uh, there's too many people trying to access this da the data, not enough tools, not enough uh, ways to, to do it without duplicating all the data and spending a lot of money to do so. So in, in lieu of spending an ordinate amount of money and an and excess in, in OPEX and CAPEX, there's an alternative approach. And it has worked with our customers and it might be right for you. Uh, the questions on the right seem to be the the first way of weeding out customers, uh, whether it's an opportunity for you, whether you have on-premises uh, uh, analytic uh, activity, uh, whether you are running with multiple petabytes. Uh, this is certainly not something for a little bit of data. This is a lot of data. Uh, do you have multiple clusters, whether it's Spark and Hadoop? Um, and do they need to have a shared data set? And do you also have non-Spark and Hadoop tools that need to access these same, same data sets? If you feel that most of these answers are a positive, then it's likely that this type of environment might benefit you. So here is one unsolicited account from a, a government customer, and because it's a government foreign customer, it's completely anonymous. But what this this account talked to us about was really unlocking value. This environment, this architecture has helped them unlock value by releasing the lock on data because before it was limited to certain people. Now it is open access and it's opening the process to more and more process, uh, people and more and more types of analytic tools. Uh, Prior to using this type of environment, there was a lock on compute, meaning that they had a certain number of uh, tools and there was compute and storage locked together, and now they're able to spin up and decommission their compute according to the customer needs at the right time. And finally, innovation. This is allowing people to innovate more than they were before. Uh, as he says, any, it allows anyone to try to build up something new without the fear of messing things up. Uh, it can tolerate mistakes at all levels, and by doing so, our developers can be much more daring. It gives more power to the data scientists to be able to access this data. A lot of this has been documented by, by the teams inside Red Hat, and including in Karan's team. There's a set of... Um, uh, uh, reference architectures, and also some blogs that have been posted off the Red Hat storage blog page. The ones in blue are the ones that are current. The ones in black are planned. So there's a lot of investment here uh, that's trying to document these best practices and put them in paper. 
And here are some pointers for how you can get more information on social media from us. The blog page that I'm referencing is right here. We're also very active on Facebook, Twitter, uh, and the web. So I would like to thank all of you. And by all means, if you have any questions, please feel free to, to ask right now or catch up with us afterwards. Any questions? Hi, thank you for the presentation. Um, in our teams, the people actually like the lock on uh, storage and the lock of compute. In particular, they keep them in lockstep for performance reasons. Uh, your, scalable, your architecture scales very nicely, but how do you deal with questions of performance? So, I mean, I'm very hard to, to hear this one, but uh, is it uh, the question around performance uh, of uh, the set? Yes, yes, people like to keep their, their compute and their storage on the same boxes for performance reasons. Yeah, I mean, that's, that's true, but uh, if you think about uh, uh, when originally uh, Google published the MapReduce paper like 10 years back, it was uh, that, okay, you need to have computer and storage because of uh, the network bandwidth, the network, uh, the network was not uh, big enough to push the data through, but things have been changed quite a lot th in uh, these days. You, our customers, uh, we, are, you, we are deploying Ceph clusters these days on, on a 25 gig, 12 to, or 50 gig, or even 100 gigs of, uh, of network band back when. It also, uh, I mean, it also depends on the use case that you have. If, uh, uh, if you're having a high throughput kind of requirement, then of course it could do it. We have seen the in testing. But uh, something like if you have a real uh, active or, or, or querying job, active querying jobs, then probably you need to uh, think about it double, uh, twice before moving into this. But uh, uh, there are tech, like uh, Spark produces, uh, helps you with uh, uh, in-memory things. You need, there are a lot of things that you could tune in, in this architecture. And uh, one other thing that, uh, that we are doing and we have been testing around uh, in, uh, in our team is that uh, we, have seen, we have seen really great results with this. It's not like you will get a 200 or 300% performance improvement compared to HDFS, but we are actually in parity with HDFS. So uh, the customers, the customer that you're working with, they are said, okay, if we can, if I need to, if I'm getting a parity with, on the performance, plus I'm getting the agility of launching uh, uh, on-demand compute uh, and analytics cluster, I'm fine with this, I'm good with it. Even with, I'm, I'm having 10% of performance loss, I could go with that. And uh, one other thing that we're gonna work, I mean, uh, the things are in, uh, in, in the draft right now, is, uh, uh, is the paper that we're gonna publish after, I guess, uh, I guess around Christmas time or maybe next year, early next year. So that should talk about in detail about the testing methodology we have used and how the performance compared with, uh, with HDFS and uh, what, is, what it is good for and what it is bad for. Okay, and a quick other question. Have you also been looking at the hyperconverged setups where you run your storage and compute on the same physical machines? Uh, not specific, not for not for this kind of workload. So, uh, if you have a data analytics workload, probably uh, will not do a hyperconverge because of uh, a lot of reasons, respect to performance. So, uh, the idea is that if, if you uh, want to make a data lake kind of uh, environment, it's, it's it's the best way to keep your computer and storage uh, separate so that you could even scale it without uh, uh, without uh, uh, you know paying extra even for computer and storage. Otherwise, it would be the same as, uh, as, a, uh, uh, as a monolithic design. You will have computer and storage on the same box. Okay, thank you. Uh, we're past the closing time. We're past the closing time. So thank you very much for coming.